My goodness, another year is done and dusted and in the books, and it's been another excellent year for Home Assistant and for Home Assistant users. Which means that all that's left to do before we move into the next year, into 2024, is to take a look back at the last 12 months of Home Assistant changes and take a look at my favourite features from the last year. Very quickly before we get into the list, I thought it'd be really cool to take a look at how the number of users has grown over the last year, which if we take a look at January of 2023, was around 210,000 users, which is an impressive number. But fast forward to today, and it's now over 300,000 users who all have analytics turned on, which is some serious growth. You love to see it. Let's see where we are in the next year's recap, make this a little bit of a tradition. I'm gonna make a guess of 439,000 users. Let's see. Kicking us off with number 10 is a feature that was added in the April release of this year. And this added a way of making code for templates reusable with macros. Template macros are a great way of reducing the amount of repetitive code that you need to write. And it makes creating templates that are similar to each other much quicker as all you need to do is create a macro with the template code you want to use and then call that macro inside of any template sensor. To use a macro, you simply need to create a template inside the custom templates folder in Home Assistant using the special macros braces. And then when you are creating a template sensor, you can import that macro and start using it right away to create multiple sensors really quickly. Template macros were a great addition and they deserve number 10 on this list. Next up at number nine is all of the various dashboard cards, features, and dialogues that were added for use within our dashboards. This year, of course, was Year of the Voice, which saw a strong focus on voice features, but it's easy to forget just how many dashboard and UI improvements we got all throughout this year too. In fact, I counted a total of 27 different additions throughout the course of this year, that were either new dashboard cards with modern designs, new features for cards to change how you control devices, or more info dialogues, which were all completely revamped. That's not even including the various other UI improvements we saw like sensor precision, template creation, copy and paste for automations and cards, and so on. So yeah, we saw a lot of UI improvements this year. Some of my favorites include the new climate control card from the December release, which saw a total redesign. That looks amazing and is now my favorite climate card out there right now for dashboards. I also really like the new favorite color presets for lights that was added in June. And I also really like the alarm panel dialogue that was added in April. But really there were so many good ones to choose from this year. So yeah, that was my, one of my favorites was all of the new UI improvements we got throughout the year. Number eight was a nice quality of life improvement that landed in September's release and allowed you to create templates inside of the UI. If you've ever needed to create something a little bit more advanced with a template sensor, that would typically involve diving into configuration files, but with 2023.9, they added the feature to be able to create templates directly inside of the UI and meant there was no need to reload. One of the best things about it was that it could also show you a preview of what your template looks like as you were editing it, something that wasn't possible using the old config method. Number seven was the headlining feature of the July release and laid the framework for a new powerful way to interact with services in automations and scripts, which was the service call response feature. In previous releases, when you called a service like you do often in the action section of an automation, the action would simply happen and there would be no way of knowing what happened or even getting extra information from that service call. Not usually a problem for something like turning a light off as you don't really need any extra information, but for more complex services, it was a bit limiting. But as of the July release, services can now respond with information after the call was completed. Again, this was just the framework in the July release but it does prove useful for services where you want to retrieve information, such as calling the service to get the current weather, where the service can now respond with the weather forecast, or even the to-do list service that gets you a list of your current to-do list items and returns them to you in that service call, 
which you can then use in your automations to send notifications or text-to-speech messages, for example. This is a really powerful feature that I think we will see greatly expanded in the next year. Moving on to number six was the new event entity added back in August. This is one of those things that seems so simple to us now, but probably involved a ton of work behind the scenes, yet is such a big upgrade over the previous way that we had of interacting with events. Events and Home Assistant, according to the docs, are the core of everything. Basically, anytime something happens in Home Assistant, an event will be generated. Now, most of the time, we don't need to worry about events since we don't typically interact with events, we interact with entities. But there are times when you do need to do so, such as if there isn't an entity for something you're looking for, like a key code press on an alarm panel or button presses on a doorbell, resulting in having to dig through these events to try and figure out what was going on. Luckily, Home Assistant would allow you to automate off of these manual events, but it was quite daunting to do, particularly for beginners. However, in 2023.8, there was a new type of entity added, which was the event entity. This made things so much easier to work with events, like button presses in Home Assistant, as it meant that they were just simply an entity with a state, just like anything else. For example, if you have a four button remote, that remote can now show an event entity for each of the four buttons and the state will be whatever the last type of press was. This makes using them in automations way easier, faster and cleaner than ever before and was a very much needed upgrade. At number five was a relatively small feature in comparison to some others, but was one that I was personally in desperate need of as I'm sure many others were, if you have or you manage more than one Home Assistant server, and this was multi-server support in the mobile app, which was added in March. If you're like me, you probably have a main Home Assistant server for your house, along with a secondary one for testing, and then you also maybe have a third one, which is located at your parents' or a relative's house that you are also responsible for managing too. And doing that in the mobile app before wasn't possible, at least on Android. And I basically just used to revert to using Chrome with multiple tabs open for different servers, but that does have some downsides and just isn't as seamless as the app. But my prayers were answered in March, which allowed you to add multiple servers and manage them all inside of the Home Assistant app, allowing you to quickly switch between the active one with a simple gesture. This was a huge improvement for me and others with multiple servers, and it was possible on iOS for quite some time already, but this update added it to Android and personally made it one of my favorite features of the year. Next up at number four, and possibly a hot take for some of you since it's not number one, but I'm gonna put all of the voice features from this year at the number four spot. So as we know, this year was Year of the Voice, which puts a strong focus on adding a local voice assistant to Home Assistant this year, which it's never really had before, allowing you to control your smart home with your voice whilst keeping data private and local. We've saw a great many strides towards this mission with really good progress made this year since we essentially started with literally no way to use voice with Home Assistant in January, and we've ended up with several ways to talk to Home Assistant and control devices almost one year later in December. First, they added the ability to give text commands to Assist for control, and then we could talk to Assist via house phones and push to talk on ESB home devices. Then we got custom sentences for automations, Android and Wear OS support, and then finally, we got wake word support, kinda, on ESP home devices, which I think we can all agree is great progress to have made in just one year. Not to mention all of the translation and language support to work that happened continuously by the community over the last year too. Now, it does still have some ways to go yet, but it's really exciting to see the improvements and developments going on, which begs the question, why isn't this my favorite feature coming in at number one then? Well, truth is, I'm actually not that big of a voice user myself. Even though I have Nest devices in pretty much every room, it's very rare that I actually use them for voice and they pretty much just do music. Voice is just not a natural way for me personally to control my smart home like it is for some others. 
Now, yes, I do use it a bit more now with Home Assistant having support, but it's more because I'm interested in testing the capabilities and not because it's my favorite way to control things. Which begs the question, why is it so high at number four then? <laughs> That's simple really. Just because it's not something that I use a ton doesn't mean that I'm not excited to see all of the development and changes happening, especially because I know there are lots of other users who do enjoy using voice. And I also think the mission of building a local voice assistant with privacy in mind is just really cool too. So voice was a big one this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing the changes that happen over the next year too. Who knows what we could be talking about in the next Rewind video. Coming into the top three from this year, this was actually a tricky one to decide which was my favorite out of these ones, but number three is the to-do list feature. This was quite a big addition that happened later on in the year in November's release with improvements being made in December. So this feature kind of started out, I guess, with the introduction of a new entity type, the to-do entity, which was specifically added for creating to-do lists, kind of like a shopping list, a task list, or anything else that you would store in list format. We also got a nice dashboard for creating and managing task lists, along with services for interacting with them, which was something that we were previously missing from the old shopping list integration, and really allowed you to take automations to the next level because you can now directly retrieve the contents of a to-do list using a service and a response call, which can then be used in your automations. For example, to send notifications. It also meant that you can technically have multiple shopping lists now, which again, wasn't possible previously with the old shopping list integration. The to-do list integration was definitely a highlight for me as I like to use to-do lists for automating reminders as well as some other bits and pieces and one that I think we're going to see even more improvement on in the future, which I'm really looking forward to. Number two is one that I think not a lot of you will have seen coming and was probably one that flew under the radar for most of you, but I personally really loved it, even though on the surface, again, it's so simple. And this was the easier adding of ESP Home devices that was added in November. Now, this isn't a big feature or something you'll probably see or even notice if you're creating your own ESP Home devices with your own configs. However, if you create devices using firmware examples from ESP Home, such as creating the voice assistant with the Echo Atom, or even making a Bluetooth proxy device, or if you're buying devices with ESP Home already installed on them, which we are starting to see more of now, then this feature makes the process of getting that device onto your Wi-Fi and connecting it to Home Assistant even quicker and more seamless than before. So now if you get a new device that has ESP Home on it and you plug it in, if it's configured correctly, it will start broadcasting over Bluetooth and be immediately auto-magically discovered in Home Assistant's device page, where you can then enter your Wi-Fi credentials and have it join your network, which is so cool. Again, loads of you are probably like, really Lewis, this is your second favorite feature from this whole year. But I just think this is a really cool feature for making the entire setup process even more slick and seamless than ever before. And it's a nice quality of life improvements to get even more people using or even making ESP home devices. Nice. Last but not least, my favorite feature of this year is one that if you are a long time viewer of this channel, you will know I have been asking for in my predictions list for the last two years now and wanted for far longer than that. Plus it's like one of the most requested features of all time, I think, by community members. And that is the ability to add network storage, which finally landed in June and made me so happy. Being able to add network storage has two primary functions in Home Assistant for now. Firstly, you can configure it to store media items such as music or video clips that you want to store for playing back media on devices, or even to store security camera clips that come from something like Frigate. Or you can also configure it for storing Home Assistant's backups, which is hugely important as it means that you aren't storing the backup for Home Assistant on Home Assistant itself in the event that you have a hardware failure and means that you can easily retrieve that backup for doing a restore. Being able to offload both of these things, particularly media devices, to a NAS 
is awesome and it means that your main Home Assistant server won't run out of storage suddenly and stop working. This was a huge feature from this year and so glad to see it finally added. So it was another big year for Home Assistant and that was a look back at some of my favourite features from this year. But I would love to hear what your favourites were as I'm sure they're going to be completely different to mine. That's the thing is that I feel like there was a good mix of different features this year with something for everyone in every release. So let me know what your favourite was down in the comments. And other than that, all that's left to say really is that that's it for me for this year. Thank you so much for the incredible, incredible support from you all. It's been truly amazing and I am forever grateful for it. And I can't wait to see what happens next year. I definitely think there's going to be some good things coming. I hope you have a happy new year. Enjoy your time with your families. And I will see you in the next video and in the next year.